on World News Tonight. Sky High Tensions. The United States and China shake hands on a high-stakes agreement. Malevolent Media. New revelations by whistleblowers uncover Facebook's ugly truth. Battling Covid. AstraZeneca introduces a brand new weapon into the arsenal against the spread of the pandemic. Games begin. Sensational responses to a brand new thrilling adventure of life and death. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the United States. U.S. President Joe Biden said that he, sp he has spoken to Chinese President Xi Jinping about Taiwan and they agreed to abide by the Taiwan Agreement as tensions have ratcheted up between Taipei and Beijing. As tensions mount between China and Taiwan, U.S. President Joe Biden has spoken on the phone to Chinese President Xi Jinping. Biden told reporters on Tuesday that both leaders had agreed to keep to the Taiwan Agreement, an apparent reference to Washington's policy of recognizing Beijing rather than Taipei, on the expectation that the future of Taiwan will be determined by peaceful means. China claims Taiwan as its own territory and has not ruled out the possible use of force to achieve unification. The island, which broke away from the mainland in 1949, rejects Beijing's claims and has its own democratically elected government. Over a four-day period beginning last Friday, Taiwan reported close to 150 Chinese Air Force aircraft entered its air defense zone. The show of force from Beijing has been condemned by Washington and Taipei. Taiwan's defense minister said on Wednesday China will be capable of mounting a full-scale invasion by 2025, adding that relations were at their worst level in more than 40 years. At a Senate hearing, Facebook whistleblower Frances Hogan insisted Congress must act against a company she says won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. Facebook dismissed Hogan's testimony, saying that she mischaracterized some documents that she stole. Facebook under fire tonight. The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. Whistleblower Frances Haugen insisting Congress must act against a company she says is misleading the public, promoting hateful and harmful content, holding its CEO to account. In the end, the buck stops with Mark. Haugen left Facebook in May, armed with tens of thousands of internal documents, including some, she says, showing the company knows its Instagram app can contribute to eating disorders in teen girls, a characterization Facebook has disputed. It's just like cigarettes. Teenagers don't have good self-regulation. They say explicitly, I feel bad when I use Instagram, and yet I can't stop. Um, we need to protect the kids. And to do that, Haugen says, Facebook must share more about its algorithms, which determine what content pops up on your feed, incentivized, she says, towards problematic posts. This inability to see into Facebook's actual systems and confirm that they work as communicated is like the Department of Transportation regulating cars by only watching them drive down the highway. From Facebook, an aggressive defense. And what you have here today is a former employee who didn't work on these issues and was just at the company a couple of years, uh, mischaracterizing some documents that she stole. Hallie, my strategy is, and our strategy is to make sure that we're giving people accurate information about what we're doing. Facebook actually has been calling for regulation for more than two and a half years now. On regulating big tech, rare bipartisan agreement. After years of hearings, Congress calling yet again for changes. Those could include internal research released to outside parties, stronger federal oversight that demands transparency from big tech, or a requirement platforms share their proprietary algorithms with regulators. U.S. President Joe Biden pitched his costly support package yet again despite Republican lawmakers maintaining their stance on the unfairly high price tag, claiming the package will support the middle class. We risk losing our edge as a nation. To support these investments is to create a rising America. America is moving. To oppose these investments is to be complicit in America's decline. 
U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday made a pitch in Michigan, rallying support for his social spending package as Democratic lawmakers in Washington wrangled over the price tag. Biden told workers at an International Union of Operating Engineers training facility that his plan would help modernize America and benefit the middle class. These bills are about competitiveness versus complacency. They're about opportunity versus decay. They're about leading the world or continue to let the world pass us by, which is literally happening. Squabbling Democratic moderates and progressives dealt Biden a major setback last week when they failed to move ahead with his proposed $1 trillion infrastructure bill or the planned $3.5 trillion social spending bill, which is now facing cuts. Rebuilding infrastructure was one of Biden's key election promises, while the larger Build Back Better bill includes child care, health care benefits, free community college tuition and clean energy subsidies, all paid for by increased taxes on the wealthy and corporations. But at $3.5 trillion, some moderate Democrats say the plan is too big and should be scaled back. Progressives say they won't vote for the smaller infrastructure bill until a deal is struck on the bigger, more ambitious bill. Biden argued the investments are urgent. Our competitors aren't hanging around and waiting to see what we're going to do. Before leaving Washington, Biden met virtually with moderate Democratic members of the House of Representatives about the infrastructure bill and his Build Back Better agenda, a meeting the White House described as productive. World leaders were on the defense after the release of millions of documents detailed how heads of state use offshore tax havens to stash assets worth hundreds of millions of dollars. 35 current and former leaders are featured in roughly 11.9 million documents leaked from financial service companies. The Pandora Papers investigation says advisors helped King Abdullah II of Jordan set up at least three dozen shell companies from 1995 to 2017. They were used to secretly buy 14 luxury homes in the United States and the United Kingdom. Abdullah, during a meeting with tribal leaders, denied any impropriety. Unfortunately, there is a campaign against Jordan, and there are still people who want to sabotage the relationship between us and build suspicion. There is nothing to hide. We are stronger than this. Another denial came from the Chilean president, Sebastian Piñera, who the Pandora Papers investigation says used offshore companies for dealings involving a mining project. More than 12 years ago and before my first presidency, I disassociated myself completely and totally from the administration and management of the family companies and any other company in which I had participated. The Mexican president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, went on the offensive. He is not implicated but wants to shed light on the nearly 3,000 Mexicans, including a minister, whose names appear in the investigation. The Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan took a similar attack with members of his inner circle accused of hiding millions of dollars in wealth. In a tweet, he said, My government will investigate all our citizens mentioned in the Pandora Papers, and if any wrongdoing is established, we will take appropriate action. The Kremlin, meanwhile, dismissed Pandora Papers' revelations as unsubstantiated. It's alleged a luxury Monaco property was purchased for a woman previously reported to have been in a relationship with President Vladimir Putin. France and the United States edge closer to reproachment as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken accepted that the U.S. was partly to blame for the submarine crisis and the way the deal with Australia was announced could have been handled better. Edging closer to rapprochement, as Washington's top diplomat accepted a share of the blame. In a French television interview, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the way the submarine deal was announced could have been handled better. We could and we should have communicated better. That's what President Macron and President Biden have said to each other when they spoke a few weeks ago. Also, we sometimes tend to take for granted a relationship as important and deep as the one between France and the United States. Blinken's visit comes almost three weeks after a bombshell announcement by the U.S., Australia and the U.K. about their new military pact, which scuttled a multi-billion euro French submarine contract with Canberra. 
The move blindsided Paris, upending its relations with Washington. The French foreign minister called it a stab in the back, while President Macron briefly recalled France's ambassador to the U.S. Since then, the U.S. President Joe Biden and Emmanuel Macron have talked on the phone. Earlier on Tuesday, Blinken met with both his French counterpart and the president. There are signs tensions with the U.S. are easing. Speaking at an informal EU summit later on Tuesday, Macron said he was hoping to work once again with the U.S. in good faith. We will catch up during the G20, and I think it would be the right occasion to see how we can re-engage very concretely. Um, my point is not, uh, honestly, I don't, uh, it's not an issue about words or perception. It's an issue about facts and what to do together. However, France's anger with Australia has not abated. A long-planned round of free trade talks between Canberra and the EU has been postponed. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Heavy rain swept across much of southern France, inundating the city of Accent province and leaving France's second largest city, Marseille, under a blanket of trash that had piled up on the streets following a rubbish collector strike. For more on this, we have other than a world news pressure correspondent, Chetana Dharmaratna, reporting from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Shanali. Thousands of cans littered Marseille's popular Borley beach, along with mounds of plastic and rubber tires. Some volunteers working to clean the area even picked up dead rats. According to Meteor France, the National Meteorological Service, the equivalent of several months of rain, pounded Marseille between Sunday and Monday. After the Huayne River birds its banks, large trashed items such as gas bottles, fridges and car parts added to the mounting trash piles. Larger amounts of trash started piling up and have got swept away with torrent from it this morning and blocked the sewers. Marcel's deputy mayor Christine Just spoke of scenes of horror, with some city officials blaming the disaster of the previous administration. Marcel's urban planner said officials over the years continued to build concrete everywhere, adding the past officials had ignored the fact that nature needs space for water to flow. In the city of aix en province the water itself was a bigger issue with rescuers having to pluck people to safety as the floods turned backyards into small lakes. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news pressure correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. An investigation into sexual abuse in the French Catholic Church has found that an estimated 216,000 children were victims of abuse by clergy since 1950. The latest abuse scandal to hit the Roman Catholic Church suggests that clergy in France may have sexually abused children on an unprecedented scale for 70 years. An estimated 216,000 children until as late as 2016. The revelations came from an independent inquiry by the church, which released its findings on Tuesday. It reports that since the 1950s, there have been about 2,900 to 3,200 suspected paedophiles in the French church and the number of victims may rise to 330,000 people when including abuse by members of the church who are not clergy. Most of the victims were boys aged between 10 and 13. Jean-Marc Sauvé, who led the investigation, said the findings are damning and that the church sometimes knowingly put children in touch with predators. Olivier Savignac is the head of the Victims Association Speak Out and Live Again, which contributed to the report. He was himself abused as a child. The inquiry says the French church didn't take serious steps to address the issue until 2015 or 2016. The commission started in 2018 after Pope Francis demanded clergy wipe out the sexual abuse of minors. The president of the Bishop's Conference of France, Eric de moulin beaufort has asked for forgiveness. In a statement released by the Vatican, Pope Francis expressed his sorrow at the findings in the investigation, but praised his victims for their courage. 
Now on to the updates of the COVID crisis. Some concerning news as latest release studies show that the efficacy of the Pfizer jab has dropped over half its initial percentage following the second dose, opening discussions on the need for booster vaccines. Data released on Monday suggests that the effectiveness of Pfizer and BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine drops by nearly half six months after the second dose. The data was published in the Lancet Medical Journal and had previously been considered by U.S. health agencies deciding on the need for booster shots. But the data suggests the vaccine still remains 90 percent effective at preventing hospitalization and death, even against the Delta variant, for at least six months. Researchers from Pfizer and Kaiser studied the health records of over three million people over the span of eight months. The analysis suggested Pfizer's vaccine effectiveness against the Delta variant was 93 percent after the first month, plunging to 53 percent after four months. Against other variants, efficacy declined from 97 percent to 67 percent. Researchers say the drop in effectiveness is due to waning efficacy rather than more contagious variants, and that the data suggests Delta isn't evading virus protection. Meanwhile, there was no data on the occupations of study participants, nor their adherence to mask-wearing guidelines, either of which could have affected their likelihood of virus exposure. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has authorized Pfizer booster shots for older adults and Americans at high risk of getting infected. Scientists have called for more data on whether boosters should be recommended for all. We have some good news for you. AstraZeneca has requested emergency use authorization for U.S. regulators for its new treatment to prevent COVID-19 for people who respond poorly to vaccines because of a weakened immune system. AstraZeneca is seeking U.S. approval for a new COVID treatment. It's asked for emergency authorization from the Food and Drug Administration. That is according to a statement from the U.K. firm. It concerns an antibody therapy dubbed AZD7442. AstraZeneca says a late-stage trial shows it reduces the chances of developing COVID-19 symptoms by 77%. It says the treatment could help people who don't develop a strong immune response after vaccination. Regular shots require a healthy immune system to develop antibodies in response, while the new treatment contains lab-made antibodies. U.S. approval would be a big win for the company. Its widely used shot still hasn't been approved for use there. AstraZeneca says talks regarding supply of the new treatment are ongoing with the U.S. and other countries. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The UN World Meteorological Organization has warned that more than 5 million people may have inadequate access to water by 2050. The new report said that the figure is an increase from 3.6 billion in 2018. A protester disrupted a Louis Vuitton fashion show in Paris by walking down the catwalk with a banner condemning the impact of excessive consumption on the environment. Japanese-born American Saikuro Manib, Germany's Klaus Hazelman and Italy's Giorgio Parisi won the 2021 Nobel Prize for Physics for their groundbreaking work around climate change. A beached humpback whale was saved on Argentina's Atlantic coast after an hours-long rescue effort from environmental authorities and rescuers. Mexico could see asylum applications jump 70% this year compared with 2019 as requests from Haitians saw, though most of those Caribbean migrants do not meet the criteria under current rules. And finally tonight, Squid Games continue to impress viewers around the world. Various related items are enjoying booming popularity. The key players of the Korean drama are set to make appearances on the American chalk shows. The Squid Game craze is all over the world. After topping India's chart, the survival drama became the first to rank top in all 83 countries the streaming analytics platform Flix Patrol currently gets data from. And global fans' interest is not limited to just watching the show. They are flocking to see the Squid Game props. The scene-stealer doll isn't the only one attracting interest. 
fans worldwide are also hooked by Korean games shown throughout the drama, such as cutting the shape apart from Targona candy. A pop-up store opened in France over the weekend and enjoyed great popularity, with some fans even reportedly staying up all night to get in. An expert says the incredible attention the series is getting is because everyone can relate to its theme. Foreign media outlets, too, agree that the class struggles outlined in the dystopian drama speak to reality. Adding to that, the Wall Street Journal underlined Netflix's efforts to emphasize visuals by outfitting participants in green tracksuits and building colorful sets to resemble children's playgrounds. Saying it could be Netflix's biggest hit ever, the paper pointed out that the streaming giant's aggressive investment in creating Korean content has paid off. As the buzz continues worldwide, the cast members are scheduled to appear on a U.S. talk show. NBC confirmed that the leads, including Lee Jong-jae, will be on The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon on October 6th, local time. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.